Okay, I have just got back from watching Star Trek Beyond at the cinema tonight. I have not done any additional research from anything else beyond that, so this is just literally fresh thoughts direct from my brain to the camera, through the internet, to yourselves. I've got to admit, I liked it. It was good. Everything you see in the trailer is obviously what you see in the movie because obviously the bits from the movie get put into the trailer. So there's no spoilers beyond obviously what you already know. At least as far as this review is concerned. There may be other reviews if YouTube's doing what it's supposed to be doing down the side there that might actually give spoilers. I'm not doing that. I'm just telling you what I thought of the movie itself. First off, yeah, it's unavoidable. The death of the Enterprise. It happens. It's not a dream. It happens. It's real. I mean, it plays a major, major part of it. That's the third time in 13 movies that the Enterprise has died. Now, in this particular case, it obviously isn't a remake of Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock, but it does feature that same circumstance, the Enterprise dying. Okay, the Enterprise being killed. This time, directly at the hands of the enemy rather than Kirk hitting the self-destruct, but, you know, what you're gonna do? And that obviously sets in motion the rest of the movie. Everybody in the cast has something to do. Chekhov especially has a far, far more to do in this movie than he did in Into Darkness. Chekhov in Into Darkness felt to me more like a glorified cameo more than anything else. Whereas this time around, he's got plenty to do. Watch the movie to find out what. You know, he, you know, Anton's death is made all the more tragic in that we can really finally see just what he could do with Chekhov to really help differentiate him from Walter Koenig's uh, version of the character and any other version of the character that's came since. And that just makes his death all the more tragic. So young, so much potential. Yeah, let's not dwell on that though. There's also tributes to Leonard Nimoy. Uh, there's at least three times in the movie where they do that. But they are very short, they are very poetic, they are very sweet, they are very poignant. The final one basically involves young Spock looking at uh, a photograph of the crew in their old age, the original cast, uh, looking like it must have been at the end of the Undiscovered Country. Um, and it's the death of Spock Prime, Ambassador Spock, Spock 1. Um, that seems to motivate Spock in a lot of ways. Going through this particular series of events seems to make this Spock sort of go through a rebirth of sorts. In the first two movies, he was very, very strictly logical. He had the Vulcan logic stick round right up the taxi, except for the couple of occasions where he lost all emotional control and went absolutely ape. Uh, this time around, there's no going psycho on his part. Um, he has a much more balanced performance. There was never anything about his uh, the performance of this Spock that didn't make you think it wasn't Spock, but this time around, he feels more like Spock, more like the Spock that we know already from the TV show and the movies than he was before, if that actually makes any sense. Now, Chris Pine is as usual, excellent as Captain Kirk is, his version of Kirk still feels different to Shatner's, but that's for the benefit of this character because it's still a much younger version of Kirk. He's still not doing the Kirk mannerisms, which is always a good thing. But you can see the same sort of fatigue that Kirk was going through in the original Star Trek movies, okay? Uh, as of Star Trek 2, he felt his age and his position, um, you know, the pressures of the position, the reality of what was going on, he felt those more and more. In this case, that's partly because this version of Kirk is feeling he's joined Starfleet for all the wrong reasons, okay? At this point in time, 
basically he's got another birthday coming up and it's a birthday that his dad never had. He's now reached an age where he's older than his dad was when his dad died. Bones does his best to uh, obviously get him out of that rut but it's not until the end of the movie that he's fin finally out of it. The events of the movie having reborn him as well. As always Simon Pegg is excellent as Scotty. Uh, oh, Dr McCoy is brilliant. I can't remember the actor's surname right now so I'm not going to refer to him by his first name because that just somehow seems disrespectful. Uh, the Zulu being gay scene in this case. There's actually about three circumstances where his family life comes up. Just so subtly done. Okay, that you don't actually have any reason to have any kind of problem with it. With it. Yeah, there's a, there's a bit of controversy about revealing that Zulu is gay, but it's done in such a subtle way that it makes no difference whatsoever. We've got to remember this is a different timeline. The characters have grown up in different circumstances. You would think that Zulu would be less affected maybe than say Kirk and Spock would be, but who, who, who knows? Ever since George Takei came out as gay back in 2003, I think, a lot of fans have sort of retroactively applied uh, gay status to Zulu. I haven't heard any differently if, uh, if George Takei has changed his uh, opinion on this matter yet, but Takei has pointed out that Zulu was always meant to be straight, that he had raised the issue of possibly having a gay character in Star Trek, and Gene Roddenberry was in favour of it apparently, but knew he, there was no way he could get that past the censors, that past the network executives, that past anybody that wouldn't want that particular episode either cut to ribbons or just totally destroyed and forgotten about. All it does is just add a bit more motivation to Zulu's life. It adds more to the overall plot just from its subtle application. Okay. He's got a daughter, he's got what we're presuming is a husband. Okay, that might be this universe's version of his daughter from Star Trek Generations. Couldn't really say. And obviously there's nothing mentioned about how she was born either because it's not played into, it's just there to just depict a normal family life. That Zulu has outside of the ship. This is actually the third year of their five-year mission. Obviously referencing the fact that it's a five-year mission and it's the third movie. The original TV show had a five-year mission but it only lasted three years. So we've got three movies so even though they're made several years apart, hell, I'll go with the idea that it's uh, been three years in total. Nobody looks that different from the last movie to be honest. Uh, we've got new uniforms, both the main uniforms that we see the cast wearing. We've got off-duty field uniforms as well. Um, at first, because of the introduction of the NX-class ship that we saw in the trailers, I was assuming that was uniforms that they had gotten from the ship that they'd had to change into for some reason. Um, there's actually a total of three different uniforms that I noticed, three different variations. There's the standard uniform, which comes in blue, red and yellow. Then there's a field uniform that uh, Chekhov and Kirk wear, which is the, the, the yellow uh, panelled sections here and a sort of bluish colour. That kind of reminded me a bit of uh, the Enter Star Trek Enterprise uniforms. Then there's another variation which has solid red panels here and a slightly different colour suit that again reminds me of the Star Trek Enterprise uniforms but isn't. We also get to see the Star Trek Enterprise uniforms as well when they're on the NX class ship. Uh, they, they actually get to see some crew footage and some crew logs, it, you know, making use of the Enterprise style uh, uniforms. So it's nice to see that and, and keep, keep them there. The NX class ship, it's a bit of an oddity in that this is a Warp 4 capable ship. In Star Trek Enterprise, the NX 01 or 01 is a Warp 5 capable vessel, the test bed for that technology. But this particular NX class, which looks similar enough, uh, but has subtle differences, is supposed to be the first Warp 4 capable vessel, but it's got an NX registry of something like 45 or something like that. Maybe 50 something. And that doesn't really make sense unless the uh, NX registry's got reset for some reason. Anyhow, it's a missing vessel that's been appropriated by the female alien with the white face and the black lines on her face. She ends up saving Scotty, she ends up teaming up with the crew, and of course, 
you know, they go off and save the day. The Yorktown structure, what can I say about that? That is like a Dyson Sphere from Star Trek Next Generation, where Scotty was found crashed into, ironically enough. Um, but with the transparent shell and the inner... The inner workings of that are just mind-blowing. I'm willing to bet whoever had the job of constructing that particular CGI model, you know, the entire team I'm assuming that would have been behind it, must have been working on that for ages to get that to work on. It's like somebody t has taken the concept of a Dyson Sphere and a ring world, which is essentially just variations of the same thing, and then just sort of taken the ring world concept, which is again part of the Dyson Sphere, Dyson uh, Shell type uh, situation, and just sort of had it go all over the place. It's all interlinked, it all just makes sense, it's all connected, but my god, those things have to be seen to be believed. They have to be seen. They're worth looking at in their own right. That is unlike anything I have ever seen in any kind of sci-fi show or sci-fi movie in quite a long while. My hat goes off to whoever came up with that concept, my hat goes off to the team that developed that, and it works beautifully. It is amazing to behold. It does, in some regards, end up feeling a bit like a rehash of the crash scenes from uh, Star Trek In The Darkness, but that's somewhat un unavoidable, I'm afraid. You know, just don't think about Star Trek In The Darkness, just think about what's going on in this particular movie. Now, one thing that I really liked about this particular movie is the way they introduce and make use of uh, the female alien, whose name I can't remember at all. I can't remember the actress's name. This is her second big screen movie. First one being Kingsman, where she was the assassin with the uh, prosthetic blade legs. You know, given how good she was at the physical stuff both in that movie and this movie, and how good her performance in general was in this movie, you couldn't really get that much of a feel for her acting ability in Kingsman because of the way her character was written. She didn't have much in the way of lines, uh, she was just a very physical presence more than anything else. But I do hope that we're going to get to see more of her because from what I saw of her acting chops here, I think she could go places quite nicely. She could become quite a big, well-respected star. Time will tell. I've got my fingers crossed for her. But one thing I liked more than anything about how they integrated her character into this cast, into this story, they didn't make her anybody's love interest. She was ultimately just another survivor who saves some of the characters, who teams up with these characters, and then reluctantly aids them in their mission to save the rest of the crew, and then goes off uh, to help them further. Nobody hits on her. There's no sign of any kind of budding romance between her and any of the other characters. The two characters she interacts with the most are Kirk and Scotty, and you just don't get any feelings other than a, a budding mutual respect. Scotty obviously cares about her a great, great deal by the end of the movie, but it's just as a friend more than anything else. And that's refreshing to see because usually most of the movies would have had everybody sort of uh, getting all kissy kissy and lovely eyed and stuff like that. It's a refreshing to not see that. You know, to actually see people just have a relationship. And that said, the relationship between the crew members is absolutely fantastic. Everybody has something to do here. Everybody has some massive contribution in some regard, no matter what it might be. Okay, whether it's Spock and Yehura's relationship, okay, whether it's uh, Bones and uh, Spock's bickering and saving each other a couple of times each, whether it's the scenes with Kirk and uh, Chekhov, but it's uh, the, the subtleness of the scenes with Zulu and his daughter and his uh, husband. You know, there's lots of great interactions between the crew. There's lots of great demonstrations of just how close these people are by now. And it just would have been nicer to have seen that in Into Darkness, but that's a, obviously a different subject altogether. You did get that in Into Darkness, it's just not to this kind of degree. And in some regards, some characters had very little to do in that movie. Chekhov being one, and he has had a lot more to do with this time around than he ever has before. Now, I've seen a few different reviews about this movie already. Some obviously trash it because the, the people who write those reviews are always going to write reviews that trash everything no matter what. And a lot of reviews have, that have been more positive have said that this is going to be a movie that gives fans of the original movies 
and the original series and the original Star Trek in general and fans that came on because of the reboot movie from 2009 it is going to be something that gives them both something that they want both something that they can use and I think that's pretty true it's still not your father's Star Trek it's still not the Star Trek I grew up on it's still very much its own thing but with Simon Pegg actually writing the script this time and him himself being a fan of Star Trek and knowing what made it tick I managed to you know, marry that together with the Star Trek reboot uh, material. You do get a movie that does do service for both groups of fans here, so yes, okay, some people probably aren't going to like it no matter what, because it's still not the original Trek, that's not Shatner, that's not Nimoy, okay, and so on and so forth. If you are going to be like that, please get over it. So yeah, in general terms, if you're a fan of the original series, I've got no problems with the new cast at all, you're probably going to, to enjoy it no matter what. And if you're a fan of the newer series because of its own merits and you've had little or nothing to do with the uh, with, with the original TV show, if you've never watched it for example, you know, you're still going to enjoy it on those merits. And if you've been a casual person who's just wandered in off the street and just thought, hmm, what movie should I watch? That looks good, I'll go and watch that. You're probably going to enjoy it as well. It's still, to a certain degree, popcorn type fun, but it's popcorn type fun with a bit of brain candy, something for your mind to enjoy and bum over and think about. It's still not classic Star Trek in the thought-provoking manner that the original series was, and I doubt very much that they're ever going to go back to that because that's not what sells right now. But it is still a damn good movie in its own right, and I encourage you to give it a try, to go out, watch it, enjoy it, don't think about all the negative things you might have heard about it. There um, hasn't really been that much negativity, to be honest. Just go out, watch it, enjoy it. And apply that same premise to every other movie that you're going to see. 